Funding for New Mexico in Focus provided by the viewers like you. This week on New Mexico in Focus, the approach New Mexico's U.S. attorney is using to tackle gun violence and the rest of his job. Everything that we do at a local level between me and you, every bullet that's fired cascades in impact. Plus, are the kids all right? We ask two school counselors how students are coping with the unique stressors they faced in 2023. New Mexico in Focus starts now. Thanks for joining us this week. I'm senior producer Lou DiVizio. Our land senior producer, Laura Paskus, had another standout year in 2023. And at the end of tonight's show, she'll take us into the Colorado River watershed, where the Gila River means so many different things to so many different people. Thanks in part to funding from the Water Desk, a journalism initiative at the University of Colorado Boulder, Laura asks us to consider what lessons the river holds for the future and the rest of the Colorado River Basin. Before that, in about 15 minutes, executive producer Jeff Proctor speaks with two school counselors about the unique hurdles students are confronting and how those challenges have impacted their mental health and their coursework. But we begin with U.S. Attorney Alexander Ubayas in an interview recorded as he began his second year serving the District of New Mexico. In this, the second installment of this two-part conversation, New Mexico and Focus correspondent Russell Contreras asks Mr. Ubayas about his background and his work to address the state's troubled history of missing and murdered indigenous women. This April at a press conference when you announced a $2 million grant from the DOJ to fight violent crime in Albuquerque, you also made a passionate plea to the youth to stop gun violence. It was a very emotional plea and you spoke directly to the youth of the city. What sparked you to ask the youth of this nation, do your part and help curtail gun violence? Community. It's my firm belief that we are here together. Um, I think there's, a, there's an easy tendency, and this goes back to my first years in law school, there's an easy tendency to look at the, the format of our governments um, from the point of view of holding someone to account. Like it is my job as a lawyer to make sure that person is doing their job. Part of the cognitive dissonance for me in stepping into the legal profession was realizing that I believe we all serve a role. Um, and beyond that, we are all members of this community, right? None of us acts in a vacuum. Everything that we do at a local level between me and you, every bullet that's fired, um, as we know tragically uh, from recent events, cascades in impact. Um, every piece of plastic waste we throw away, every fake pit fentanyl pill distributed, each of these has far-reaching impacts throughout the community. And so for me, choosing this profession as a lawyer was me rejecting this idea of, you know, we need to hold somebody to account, we need to point a finger at somebody, and instead embracing this idea of one community, our community, a mutual responsibility, right? Because I didn't have to end up here. Um, one of the hardest decisions in my legal career that I made was very early on um, was between what to do the summer after my 1L year. And that summer I was offered a job um, at a large law firm that, that was offering me, I think, $30,000 for about 10 weeks of my work. And instead I chose to come and work here at the New Mexico Attorney General's office. I made that decision for this community because I believe that was my responsibility to come and serve and do what I can to make this community safer. And so to your question, <laughs> which um, is about the young men um, who are driving violence in our community. They are members of this community too, right? They are people who have experienced uncounted traumas themselves and their parents have, maybe their grandparents have. And there are people too who, even if you know, we prosecute them, we send them to prison, in the vast majority of cases, they're coming back out at some point to rejoin our community. And so whether it's now or in 10 years or five years or four, they are always members of our community. And so when I talk directly to those young men, I hope to give them that message. And it's, it's a dual promise, right? And so this is what I'm so incredibly proud of the city of Albuquerque for endorsing um, and leaning into, which is the violence intervention program here, which identifies these young men that are most at risk for shooting or being shot. And we say both of those things because it's the same population of people, right? They're the shooters and they're the victims. 
when you go and talk to them. And I've done this before with the, with the mayor and the chief, and we've, we've rode in caravan house to house, speaking with folk who you know, we've identified the, as most at risk, those who are driving violence. And we tell them, you know, here are the, do, here are the two promises, right? We want you to be safe, alive, and free. But the shooting has to stop, and so we will help you if you let us. City of Albuquerque is here, with this, especially with this new funding, whatever social services, they call it the, 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 the big little things, right? Diapers, bus passes, um, empl uh, employment contracts. We will help you if you let us, right? Um, and we will stop you if you make us. And we tell them this on the front end. We, you know, the federal government, um, want you to be safe, alive, and free. I don't want to have to lock you up. Um, but that is, you know, those are the dual promises that we give to the youth of this city, um, is that there is a way out, that we believe in you, and that fundamentally I believe in forgiveness and redemption. But to accomplish that, we do it together. We do it as a community, and we can't do it um, just by me saying, I'm going to lock you up. We can't do it just by saying, here is free services. We can't do it by threatening or by using the carrot on their own. The only way, and this is based, by, based in science, right? There's a lot of studies on this program that go back to the 90s in Boston where it was first created as a group violence intervention. The messages come together. The promises come together. It's only by marrying the enforcement side to the social services side on the front end and giving people the choice that people will make the right choice for this community. On that note, sometimes local governments, especially like Bernalillo County and Santa Fe County, will lean on the federal government and say, can you help us out? Because you guys do your job. We may have holes in our system and fighting crime. But on that note, someone could commit a crime in, in a local jurisdiction and get nine months. But if they do it in a federal jurisdiction on the, on the reservation, they could get seven years. There's a disparity there. Is there something that should be wedged in that disparity of sentencing between a local and a federal government? There's a giant disparity, and I think you've identified a couple really interesting issues there in terms of wh where they lie. Um, I have never been in a jurisdictional dispute with any of the local DAs here over a case. Um, it is because whenever, um, in fact, uh, over this weekend even, I received multiple emails, hey, will you help us with this case? Um, and that comes from the perception um, that I believe is, is backed up by the data, um, that when it comes to those, uh, those hard cases, those, those truly terrible cases, um, we get better outcomes against those folk who need to be take some time away from community. And so in terms of equalizing the, the disparities, and I, I believe you're right in those, the disparities between um, a federal uh, prosecution and state or federal prosecution and tribal, um, it, the issue is complex, right? Because we operate under different sets of laws um, with different reasons behind those laws. Um, and different stakeholders investing in each. And so, you know, I don't write the code book. It's huge. There's thousands of things that are illegal federally. Um, nor did I, you know, write, write the New Mexico State code book or any tribal law or, um, code book. But the interesting thing about being a prosecutor is this. It's, I don't get to say what is illegal. I don't get to say whether, you know, someone's conduct um, should be a crime if it's not defined in the code book. But the most important thing about being a prosecutor is our discretion. And that is where we um, have our biggest impact on society. We have to always, as prosecutors, orient our discretion towards justice, towards community safety. What that means is when we look at a charge, we look at a case, as I was saying before, we don't just look at whether a law was violated. We look at whether this is a just thing to do. And then, what are the solutions we are seeking to the problem we're trying to solve, which is community safety? How do we achieve community safety using the tools that we have? For that reason, we've invested heavily over the past year in a number of programs that recognize this interdependence of our community. Um, we've doubled the number of cases that we've sent to pretrial diversion um, within the district. And what that means is folks who um, could be charged with a federal crime, but are not. And instead, what they do is they agree to be on supervision, they agree to, to accept the support, the help that we offer. And if they do that successfully, they walk away without a conviction. 
they walk away to be productive members of our community once again without any encumbrances um, coming with a federal conviction. Has Rural prosecution and the Major Crimes Act led to, to justice? Yes and no, right? And so as I was saying about discretion, the code book is too big. Um, all federal crimes, all state crimes are not enforced. And so when it comes to what we do, we get, we get to choose, we should choose, when to use the tools, the Major Crimes Act, when or when not to use those tools, um, when they are effective at, at securing public safety, when somebody needs uh, a timeout, as I called it before, from the community to cool down, um, or when a person needs uh, to be supported, when a person needs to enter, for example, pre-trial diversion, when a person needs, for example, coming back to the community um, to be supported through a reentry court, which we are, we are, I'm actually really proud to say, we are setting up this district's first federal reentry court um, to work with people as they return. And so we use the tools that we have to address the community safety issues that we're faced with. But prosecution alone, incarceration alone, isn't enough to secure community safety. And so that's why the, I mentioned the large number of prosecutors and additional resources I'm bringing to Indian country here in the, in the district. The goal is not just to increase prosecutions. The goal is to have an, a, a holistic approach to crime and public safety. Every one of my prosecutors in that section right now serves as, as a tribal liaison. What that means is each of them have a responsibility to a specific tribe or pueblo where they interact directly and interface directly in a government-to-government -government manner, both with their governments and their law enforcement, so we can seek other options to pursue community safety. That includes everything from training, education, intervention and prevention work. And only by, as I said with the violence intervention work, marrying these multiple approaches together, which we can do as the federal government, can we bring safety to these communities. Mm. And last question, and I hear you talking, and it seems very clear where your heart is. And I know from covering uh, law enforcement, to me the prosecutor was always the hard-nosed, somewhat conservative figure. Can a progressive be an effective prosecutor? Yes. Um, I don't call myself a progressive prosecutor. Um, I call myself a prosecutor because when a prosecutor is doing his job right, he is oriented towards community safety first. And so by using these tools and thinking as a human being who's a part of this community, and not as a lawyer who fits words into statutes and argues in court, I am fulfilling my responsibility to pursue community safety and to pursue justice as a prosecutor. And so I believe very strongly that it is our role as I was discussing um, with prosecutorial discretion, to always wield that power carefully and with a mind towards the end goal. We can't prosecute every crime, nor should we. Prosecutorial discretion is a, is a valve, and it turns only one direction. It turns towards mercy. It turns against charging people. Our discretion allows us to give people mercy. And in that context, I think every prosecutor's job is to determine what is the best way in a very practical, common sense, empirical way. What is the best way to bring safety to this community with the tools that I have? And if I'm not doing that, what am I doing? Alex, thank you for joining us here on New Mexico in Focus. My pleasure. It's thank been you. an honor. This specific type of dialect has been in existence for New Mexico for the last 400 years. And what we're trying to do with the Legacy Project is make sure that we serve as an audio and digital repository to collect, protect, and preserve this language um, for the entire state and for the entire country for that matter. And making sure that hundreds of years from now when folks ask, you know, different kinds of points of language and dialect and history where Spanish was being spoken in North America, North America uh, they can say New Mexico. My conversation with National Hispanic Cultural Center Director Zach Quintero is coming up in a little over 15 minutes. 
And you can watch the first part of Russell's interview with U.S. Attorney Alexander Ubayas online right now at nmpbs.org. Now, we've spent quite a bit of time over the last few months on New Mexico in Focus talking about education, with much of our attention paid to policy. But we also knew that the student experience had to be addressed. From the anxiety of coming back from the COVID pandemic to the stress that comes with the growing threat of school violence, kids dealt with a lot in 2023. This October, we decided to talk to two school counselors who listen to concerns like those from students every day. Executive producer Jeff Proctor asks what they're seeing in the students they work with and how adults can better help young people adjust mentally and emotionally. Brian, Devin, thank you for joining me on New Mexico in Focus this week. Thank you. Thanks for having us. As we just heard, you both work as counselors in Albuquerque Public Schools which gives you both unique insight into how students are doing um, in a different way even than teachers interact with students in the classroom. I'm not a parent, but I am close with a lot of middle and high school age kids, um, and they have described over the course of the past few years some real difficulties that they have faced. Um, so Brian, I would like to start with you with the big question, are the kids all right? Are the kids all right? That's a big question, like you said. For the most part, we're trying to get them to that space, but in all honesty, many of them are not. They're struggling, many of them. A, a large major, majority of them are. Can yeah. you describe sort of the patterns or the themes that you're seeing in that struggle? What, what has sort of underpinned the struggle that you're seeing? Well, I think since the pandemic, we've seen an increase in problems with absenteeism, and um, a lot more um, substance abuse in the school. Um, students just have a rough time getting to school in general a lot of the time. And uh, if they had struggles before the pandemic, we've seen the struggles increase. So um, we're also seeing academic deficiencies as a result. So combined, we're just seeing a hodgepodge of, of large stuff they have to deal with. Yeah, yeah, issues, big issues. Devin, I know you work at a smaller school as a counselor. What are some of the things, that, the unique challenges that you've seen with some of the students who come to you for help? Well, I'm at an elementary level. So there's sometimes with the younger students, there's an undercurrent of hope even because they are younger and they have a lot of time to make things up and, and persevere. But since the pandemic, I've noticed a lot of social challenges, interacting with their peers in a way that's healthy. Um, academic challenges for sure, which impact how they interact with their peers and how they are at school. Um, so yes, I think the big question, the kids can be all right, but we need to all work together and we are. I think educators, community, families, we all need to come together to kind of push them up towards all right. But right now we have many struggling kids. So isolation is obviously a part of this. Um, students who were required to learn through a screen and instead of um, the face-to-face -face interaction that happens in the classroom, what has the transition back to in-person learning been like and has that presented its own sort of unique challenges? I think for the elementary level in particular, um, we're seeing kind of pockets of struggle, especially if they missed earlier years, pre-K, kinder, first, second, because that's where a lot of learning how to be in school takes place on top of academic learning. So I think that's been a struggle and there's some nervousness, anxiety feeling from students, not all, but it, we see it in how they interact with their peers, but also maybe want to escape the academic learning because they're mm -hmm. feeling overwhelmed. Um, but that's where we come in. That's where counselors come in, great educators come in. We kind of reteach those skills and build them back up. But I do see it with those, those younger kids as they move up that there was a deficit when they were behind the screen or not able to interact on playground or preschool or any place like that. Brian, that's sort of the idea of social emotional learning, right? Which is different from what we're learning in classrooms, right? School is supposed to be something that's more than ABCs and one plus one equals two. Um, how do you help a student with that social um, emotional learning that they've maybe lost a little bit of that skill when they're trying to come back? Definitely, we are noticing that students have lost those, some of those social emotional skills just in relating with one another, how to um, 
engage with teachers and other adults on campus. So we're seeing it just in all different areas in the school. And so what we try to do is we try to engage classrooms and small groups and even large groups in terms of like targeting how to treat one another, how to be safe online, mm -hmm. um, how to function in school because the pandemic has definitely affected kids in terms of just general school processes. You know, just having, just coming to school every day, teaching the importance of being present every day. So it's an ongoing process. And um, at my particular school, I work at Highland High School. We have a theme every month and we try to um, always include a social emotional theme. This month is suicide prevention month. So we are doing that work this month, but we also try to talk about healthy relationships with students and how to be a partner to a friend or um, a romantic partner or just be a positive family member and student. So we're reteaching those basic behaviors that students used to have mm -hmm. by the time they reached ninth grade. So we're having to do some more teaching and definitely review with the whole student population really. How do yeah. the students respond to those themes? That sounds like I was a bit of a problem child in school. That would have been something that I might have thought like, oh goodness, I don't want to deal with that. How do they respond generally? You know, it's, it's surprising that teenagers are now talking more about mental health. Mm -hmm. And um, I think social media might, that might be a positive thing about social media because it's more apparent and it's out in the public now, all over social media. And I think students are aware of what it is to not feel well. And we're trying to get the message across to students that it's okay to not be okay. And they're taking that in kind of nicely and in a relaxed fashion. And I have noticed that since the pandemic, students are learning, I mean, are listening more intently regarding mental health issues. And there's an acceptability yeah. around it. Yes. To say I'm not okay or mm -hmm. to have those conversations. I think that's really starting to be more apparent. Right. There's a lot less stigma, mm -hmm. I'm saying. And even we used to have to almost beg students at the high school level to get into therapy because we do work with therapists on our campus. Many of our schools have mm -hmm. community mental health professionals who are counselors and therapists who um, students can see. And now students are actually asking for help which is nice, mm -hmm. and um, they're receiving it many, a lot of the time, so it's, it's positive. I feel like we yeah. think of vulnerability sometimes in this context as a, like an invitation for kids to get hurt, but the idea of vulnerability as being able to concede or admit or say without shame or stigma that I'm not okay, how do you see that with younger kids and how do you encourage that kind of vulnerability? So I think it, much is in the same way you do. I mean, we, I do classroom lessons, I do small groups, I work with students individually, but I do hear it, that the, the vulnerability isn't necessarily a bad thing. But I know that when students sometimes feel vulnerable in the moment, in the classroom, in front of their peers, that's when we see behaviors. So mm -hmm. I think making sure that we use the language continue to make it acceptable mm -hmm. and so that they have the tools to speak up and say I'm not doing okay or I need help today that that's okay for them to say and they don't feel shamed or bothered by it. Mm -hmm. You mentioned the theme at Highland for this month is Suicide Prevention Month. We can't have this conversation without talking about violence in schools. Uh, when I was a student uh, in elementary school and high school it would have been incredibly rare, almost unimaginable to think about a student bringing a gun to school, let alone using it on his classmates or teachers. Mm -hmm. That is a reality, um, unfortunately, that we are faced with all the time and we have seen in our schools mm -hmm. here. How, as a school counselor, do mm -hmm. you work through that kind of reality with somebody who comes to you and wants to talk to you about it? So first, we just always listen to each student with their concerns, and we definitely f know that they are dealing with that fear. It's just like this generalized fear that students are carrying with them, and it's even evident by like little twitches they have. Some, some students have a hard time just sitting still, and their, their, their leg is always shaking, or they're needing to have some kind of stimulation. And then we just sort of like maybe dig a little deeper with students and try to get to the bottom of that fear, and oftentimes, they are, they, they are afraid you know, of, of the violence that's happening in the community and at school because we never know what's gonna happen, right? And we hear about school shootings all the time and there are more guns out there and, um, that are readily available and students know what's going on. They really do, especially at the high school level. So there is that 
low level of fear that's just constantly present, but we try to process it with each student that needs to talk about it. And really, they all need to talk about it because they're all dealing with it on some level. It's a horrible thing to have to yeah. adapt to. I, I can't is. imagine what that must be like. Um, and I, I, I would imagine you don't deal with that quite as much with younger kids, but surely they're aware of some of what's going on too. And they are, and then different students have different levels of access to the news and what mm -hmm. their families talk about. And I think I notice it more when we do drills or fire drills, or if something unexpected happens, you do, you feel an, an uptick of the nervous energy in the room of is this something serious or is everything okay but i think that's why we practice it that's why we unfortunately have to so that we can do those things smoothly but they definitely hear it they deal with it um, and there are times when it's overwhelming for them and that's when we listen we process it with them and we try to make them realize help them realize that it, they're safe that we, they've got lots of adults around them who care and we'll do their best to keep them safe so unfortunately, not many kids watch our show, but a lot of their parents and in some cases, grandparents do watch our show. So what about the kid who is doing the best they can in school, but has some of those outside stressors at home, whether it's a family member who's dealing with a behavioral health issue, um, a substance use disorder, um, homelessness. I recently read a story uh, in the journal about the large number of homeless students in APS. How can all adults, not just parents, but all of us, um, listen better to kids and find ways to meet them where they are? I think the key is being open to listening and hearing them where they're at. Um, depending on how old they are, the language might be different, but making those times to sit with them, to really listen to them, to ask questions, and be prepared to hear what they have to say. Um, it really does take everyone being on board and being willing, a grandparent, a parent, um, reaching out to the people in their students' lives, the counselors, the teacher, to say, hey, this is happening. Can we get some support from the school? Can we get some support from the school counselor? Because we hear what we can hear, but we rely on uh, the adults in their lives reaching out so that we can bridge through home and school and be the best support we can. Brian, are there other strategies for those of us who are not school-age kids anymore to be there for kids and to help them kind of get through these really challenging times? Well, I think I'm just going to piggyback off Devin. And what she said is just right on. Just be available to hear what students are saying. And it's OK to ask the rough questions. Mm -hmm. It's OK to ask the deep, deep questions, too. Like, are you doing OK mentally? Are you doing OK emotionally? Are you having thoughts of hurting yourself or others? Those are difficult questions to ask, but studies have shown that just by asking those questions, those questions can prevent many tragedies. So um, I would encourage people just to ask the deep questions if you're concerned or worried. And even if you're not concerned about a student, um, kids and teens can really cover up mm -hmm. their mental health issues. So it's good to dig a little deep deeper and ask the question a couple times, not just once. Because okay. oftentimes their, their common response is, I'm doing good, I'm, I'm fine. Are you really fine? Because I'm not, I'm not feeling that you're fine. So it's okay to dig a little deeper. To follow up question. And try not, try not to be too judgmental. Like yes. Devin said, just be ready to be open and affirming to what students are bringing to you. Because it's a different age and we're all progressing and growing, but they are dealing with just many, many deep issues. And perhaps even like piggybacking off of what they're watching, what they're seeing, and, and use that as an opportunity. Is like, oh, that character's going through that. Have you ever dealt with that? Or do you have friends that are going through this? Just to use it as an opener for the bigger conversation and, and let them be comfortable to answer. I feel like this has been a conversation filled with difficult questions. I would love to end on a note of hope and optimism. Um, without obviously uh, revealing any personal identifiers or a specific kid. Devin, can you think of some stories or themes and resilience that you've seen from the students that you've worked with over the course of these really challenging past couple of years? Well, you, as you ask that question, I find myself smiling because I, mm -hmm. I do have hope. Um, I care so deeply for my students and I see little successes every day. I, I don't I think I could say one specific one, just because I am at a small school, but I see little successes in 
students asking to go to a calming center instead of running out of the room or instead of ripping up paper. I see that as success that we can build on, that they're learning to regulate their behavior so that they can be present to make up any academic deficits or social def deficits. But um, I, I am very hopeful. I think our educators, our teachers are working tirelessly and we, in our school, we see academic gains just this last year, which is positive and wonderful. And I see social emotional growth. Um, so I think, like I said in the beginning, they will be okay if we all work together and we really put this time and effort into it as we have been. We just need to continue doing it. Brian, what are the kids at Highland doing to be okay? What, what are some of the cool things that you've seen in the face of all of this? Well, at Highland, we're really proud because our graduation rate has been increasing over the past five to seven years, which is really good. And um, we're just seeing a lot of resilience in our area, um, being that we're in the international district, there's a lot that happens in the international district. And our, not, not all of it is negative, but some of it is. And our kids are just showing just a tremendous amount of resilience just by making it to school yes. and graduating in four years. Not all graduate in four years, but we try to encourage students just it's important to graduate. If it takes five, that's fine. So we work with students who are not on track, but many of our students are getting back on track and they're doing the hard work of taking extra classes in the evening and in the summer and making it to graduation. So it's not all of them, but a large majority of them are. And so we're happy about that. Brian, Devin, thanks for coming and thanks for ending with the hope. Thank you. Thanks for having us. What does Gila mean? It's, you know, to us it's a Spanish word, you know, so it, it doesn't do much to inspire us. And so we, we rather suggested that uh, if you really want to protect this country, include us because we can tell you how to protect it. We can tell you the intricacies of the animals, the grass, the waters, the trees, the plants, everything, how they fit together and what you need to consider and how to protect it. But if you're going to break it up and just protect pieces, uh, that's not going to work either because it doesn't work that way. This fall, the National Hispanic Cultural Center began working on a project to preserve a colonial Spanish dialect spoken only in northern New Mexico. It's a historical language the center says could die within the next 18 years. The Legacy Project is a three-year archival endeavor that sends representatives into northern New Mexico to record and preserve the aging language. Center Director Zach Quintero stopped by our studio to tell me about the project. Zach Quintero, thanks for joining me here on New Mexico in Focus. It's a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Of course. The National Hispanic Cultural Center is about to begin the first of three years working on this legacy project. When had the Spanish dialect in northern New Mexico been spoken more commonly and where exactly? Sure. So this really builds around Rio Riba County, uh, starting in northern New Mexico, everywhere from, you know, Rio Riba County to Mora County to Taos County. Um, you saw an article recently in the last five months about the village of Cuesta, the town of Cuesta, and how they're specializing in a specific dialect that is traditional Spanish that goes back, you know, 200 years. And this specific type of dialect has been in existence for New Mexico for the last 400 years. And what we're trying to do with the Legacy Project is make sure that we serve as an audio and digital repository to collect, protect, and preserve this language um, for the entire state and for the entire country for that matter. And making sure that hundreds of years from now, when folks ask, you know, different kinds of points of language and dialect and history where Spanish was being spoken in North America, North America uh, they can say New Mexico. Now, what is the cultural significance of the dialect in that area? The cultural significance is, is vast. And, you know, it starts with not only the story of what built in to be New Mexico as it is alongside our indigenous communities, having shared family members, um, both Hispanic and indigenous, being able to talk about the, the larger concept of what really formed what we know now as the United States and being part of the multicultural piece of what we now understand to be the United States. So it's, it's really powerful on the cultural side to gather this information and collect this specific audio, video, and historic documents. We just received two weeks ago, um, you know, a historic document going from Valencia County to Santa Fe County from 1841. And to date that for you, the Gadsden Purchase, you know, didn't happen until after that. The Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo didn't happen until after that. The statehood of New Mexico didn't exist until after that. So 1841 is, you know, going back 
quite, quite far. And being able to ho house that here at the National Hispanic Cultural Center is really, really special for us. Now, how did you and the Cultural Center decide on devoting your attention to this specific dialect? It was a form of two parts. The first was the, the public awareness going around uh, Hispanic communities and being a good conversation with community leaders and folks in different parts of northern, central, and southern rural New Mexico who were sharing that a lot of their language was being lost, that their grandkids couldn't understand a different kind of word that their grandmother was speaking or grandfather was speaking. So first from the community it came to our attention. The second part was the media attention we started to see from the national side about subject matter experts sharing that this dialect, this specific form of Spanish being spoken, was going to be extinct in 18 years. So we saw it as an anthropological time clock that we had to go on an anthropological rescue mission here to work with our community to protect this language, this history, this spoken dialect, and preserve it. And that's exactly what our mission is at the National Hispanic Cultural Center. Are there gaps in the language now? And how are you going to work to fill those gaps if there are some? Sure, there's, there's clear gaps. And you know, that goes back to the state's history. There's um, been different practices done specifically to the Hispanic community about spoken Spanish. My parents, good example of that, um, they deliberately tried not to teach me Spanish because of how they were treated in public school, because of how they were treated um, in private sectors of the economy as well, um, trying to root out. And the, the root word that they'd like to use back in the day was assimilation, which is a very derogative term now. Um, they wanted them to forget all parts of their Hispanic identity or Latina or Latine, Latino identity and make sure that they didn't know any other language but English. So there will be gaps, there will be gaps. But what we're gonna be able to do is work with different experts in the field that are linguists, first and foremost, starting from the community that speak this traditional Spanish, that are going to these interviews with us, that are talking with community members, that have trust within the community, that share with them and help us be able to share the full context and story of how this language has developed. We see different dialects from Northeast New Mexico to Northwest New Mexico, and everything from Castilian Spanish to Basque. And it's, it's really interesting to see that kind of traditional Spanish still being spoken the way it was compared to the rest of the Americas. Um, it's, a, it's a really special way for us to be able to protect and preserve um, the, the full dialect in its entirety. Sure. Now, are there any words or phrases common in this specific dialect that stand apart from traditional Spanish spoken sure. elsewhere? So the most common known one, I would say, just from the qualitative pieces that we pulled together, uh, is plebe. So a lot of your, your viewers will know this word if they're Spanish-speaking viewers in that sense, and New Mexican, in particular, Hispanic-speaking uh, communities. Plebe is a translation of the word gente, another parallel word of it, right, which is people, so our people, plebe plev together, so our plebe, that's my person. That's our people right there. Um, that's one of the traditional words that we've come across both in southern, central, and northern New Mexico. So we see tying trends of certain words being used over and over again. Plebe is one of them. Who still speaks this dialect? And more specifically, who do you know that wants to speak this dialect still? So the folks that still speak this dialect are you know, matriarchs and trusted elders of the Hispanic community. Um, religious communities as well, um, protected communities that tend to be very private, and we're going to continue to respect that privacy, uh, that have learned this language through religious songs, right, through traditions during the holidays, through certain prayers even on Fridays to Saturdays to Sundays to Mondays, certain prayers of the day. Uh, they've learned it through their religious background. They've learned it through their community gathering background. Uh, they've also learned it through plants. Uh, through naming certain things the way they're named and sharing that and then carrying that over um, to the traditional language. So, How are you and your team working to gain trust in these communities where the dialect is spoken so that you can record and archive it but also respect the people who are currently speaking it? Well, it helps first and foremost to approach it from a place of humility and respect and understanding, you know, I have an obligation as a New Mexican, as a Hispanic New Mexican, uh, to ensure that I look at this through the eyes that is respecting the people that are speaking it right now. And that is talking with the community first and foremost of who is already speaking it in these communities, understanding the full scope of what kind of activities happen and what involves that language, and then being able to be part of it slowly and being able to share that we want to be able to protect that specific language with them slowly. And that kind of trust takes time, but it's something that I feel that we've been able to gather over the last six months in a very powerful way. Our first visit 
was to families in Mora, New Mexico, in Mora County, in the town of Mora, and being able to talk with certain family members about the form of dialect they use with their family, form of dialect they use in the community, that's a huge first step. And also working with key institution partners like uh, U UNM and New Mexico Highlands University, NMSU, Northern New Mexico College, places where people send their kids from New Mexico. New Mexico Hispanic students attend these kids and they are speaking this language still, but they're going back to their family members and saying, hey, uh, we heard about a project that involves the way that grandpa speaks Spanish or grandma speaks Spanish or the way that dad or mom speaks Spanish and they connect with us. So it's very natural of what the connection takes place between the community and us, but it's first coming from a place of respect and honoring the language to, as it's being spoken in that area. Sure. Now you talk about a connection with the community. Um, how will these families be able to, who are involved in the project, be able to access this information? Uh, obviously parts sure. of northern New Mexico internet is, isn't as easy to come That's by true. as it is down here. Will there be a specific effort to keep these people involved compared to the rest of the general public? Yes, uh, so we're taking active trips in the field, um, making sure we stay in close contact with communities that don't have internet accessibility or have direct conversations with us as the National Hispanic Cultural Center. We have remote sites that we're setting up through the Department of Cultural Affairs in partnership with some of our university institutions where we're gonna be able to have reoccurring interviews, reoccurring document scanning so we can be able to show workshop practices to preserve traditional documents. Like I just mentioned, that document from 1841 that was donated to the center and that was fantastic. And we're really grateful about those kinds of things, but we know more is out there. So we wanna be able to show and share fellow Hispanic New Mexicans and, and different folks that have these documents, how to protect their own family history, how to protect those documents so they can hold on to it and pass it on to the next generation. Or if they want to entrust it to us to protect it at the center and they can come see it, we're happy to do that too. Now, there are several different perspectives from which an organization like yours can approach a, sure. a situation like this or a project like this as anthropologists, as historians, as social linguists. Are you and the center approaching it from one of those in particular or is there value in approaching it from all three? There's value in approaching it from all three. The main one we're approaching it first with is a point of pride and honor for the community and making sure that we share it from the community's perspective first and being able to connect with them and share what kind of documents, what kind of story, what kind of language they would like to be able to first just start off the conversation with. And then as that grows, be able to share the anthropological piece behind it, which is who taught you this, right? Where did it come from originally? This town over here speaks different from this town. Why is that? Building that narrative and timeline is the history part after that. And then following straight from that is the sociological component of how did that influence the mapping of language that we have right now in the state? How did it influence the mapping of the United States for that matter? And what is be being spoken now? So. Uh, it's one thing obviously to archive and to preserve a language, sure. but there's a clear and major value in that alone. But is there any plan to teach this, to disseminate it to people so that this does become a bit more common? Sure, so the long-term goal that we have, you know, three stages. The first short term is, again, building the community partners, which we're actively doing right now and successfully carrying out and being able to do interviews and being able to pull together resources from different partners. Second part is being able to display the interim piece of what we've pulled together, like those documents. And even another recording that we got from Cuba, New Mexico, we have a series of 15 tapes that we received on a track to track player. That's a very old school way of playing audio. And it's a uh, traditional Spanish being spoken in Sandoval County in Cuba, New Mexico. It's another precious artifact that now we're trusted to be able to protect and preserve by Smithsonian standards of care. So that's the midterm part. The long-term piece is with these documents, with that audio, is serve it as a repository here at the National Hispanic Cultural Center so that when people are visiting, whether it be fellow New Mexicans or visitors to New Mexico, that may not know a lot about the Hispanic community or want to learn more about Spanish-speaking communities, how it kind of developed, and visit the NHCC and be able to listen to this and make it interactive and be able to map it out and show the history of this and be able to show the words and what they mean and the significance it means culturally uh, so that people have more education and be able to come from a place of, of love and respect towards the Hispanic community. Zach Quintero, thanks so much for joining me here on New Mexico in Focus. Thank you so much for your time. Now, we close tonight's episode focusing on southwest New Mexico and the mighty Gila River. Here's Our Land senior producer, Laura Paskus. In New Mexico, we put our rivers to work. 
We treat them as conveyance channels for water we want to use, and we use them to dilute the waste we don't want. Over the last few hundred years in the United States, this mindset has dominated our society. We think always of how rivers serve us. Rarely do we remember that rivers are their own creatures. And as living beings themselves, they have something to teach us. With funding from the water desk at the University of Colorado Boulder, the Our Land crew visited the Gila River, including a stretch that would have been changed forever if New Mexico had moved forward on a controversial diversion. In this special Our Land segment, we consider what lessons the upper Gila River holds for the future and for the rest of the Colorado River Basin downstream. Southwestern New Mexico has witnessed many battles, including over the waters of the Gila River and who gets to use them. Down in this valley, downstream of the nation's first designated wilderness area, the most recent battle was over building a diversion on a free-flowing stretch of the river high in the watershed. But people also love the Gila, even if it's for different reasons. I love swimming in a I love sitting by it, running by it. Other people love it because of the crops they grow from the water from the river, and they saw an opportunity to divert more water and have more water available throughout the year. They wanted that reliability. So it helped me to remember that we all love the same place, just from different perspectives. This river is home to so much life. It nurtures farmlands and cities, wildlife and ecosystems. If we pay attention, it also has a lot to teach us. I like to call it a reference river, a place that we can come and kind of learn how rivers used to work before they were dammed and over-diverted and dewatered. We can't really restore rivers without there being some water in them. I think the importance of some perennial flow is really something the Gila shows us. As we try to live with climate change and this increased range of flows, we're going to have even bigger floods or we're going to have even lower flows and longer periods of low flows. It's during those low flood periods that people start thinking we can like move our way back into the floodplain and that's happened in this valley. And then the floods come and people are like, oops, yes, back to the edges. The Gila is a tributary of the Colorado River, where further downstream, major cities and big irrigation districts vie for water from the Colorado's declining flows and dropping reservoirs. Here, high in the watershed, the Gila offers something else. Wildness, unpredictability, a glimpse at the past, and a map for the future. Before white settlers started farming along the Gila, this was Apache land. We refer to it as Ndebina. Shai Mbatsu Nabetin, Shima Wicho Chita Tsihetende. 
Growing up, Joe Sines' mother taught him about water. She would talk about water as a spirit. Like my grandfather used to talk about trees, like they were people, you know. Even though we live in the kind of country that we live in, as the dialogue goes, you know, we had hydrologists. We had people that understood water and where it was, how to get it, what was good, what was not. And so water has always been one of those uh, elements that uh, should be in balance with everything else. Now more than ever, we need to find balance. Here, there's still a place to learn. What does Gila mean? It's, you know, to us, it's a Spanish word, you know, so it, it doesn't do much to inspire us. And so we, we rather suggested that uh, if you really want to protect this country, include us, because we can tell you how to protect it. We can tell you the intricacies of the animals, the grass, the waters, the trees, the plants, everything, how they fit together and what you need to consider and how to protect it. But if you're going to break it up and just protect pieces, that's not going to work either, because it doesn't work that way. Breaking a river apart from its land, dividing a river into stretches, splitting the parts of a whole into whatever humans want at the moment, that doesn't work, or at least it doesn't work for long. I asked my elders, I asked them, uh, can you tell me about what this place was called? You know, because some of those names we've lost uh, from how we were scattered from this country, we've lost those. They themselves asked around to other elders, and the closest thing that we could come to that uh, they shared with me was that at one point they may have referred to the Gila and, the, and this region as Huthli, a term that describes the beginning, where everything emanates from, the start, and so it ties in with our creation stories, the river itself. Sign says that for the Apache, culture revolves around change. But so many of the changes he sees today around his home and when he leads outfitting trips into the Gila, those are different. I've noticed it in real time here. I mean, uh, for me to have grown up in a time when you could literally set your clock to some things. You can't really do that anymore. What I started to notice was the vultures and the eagles. It used to always be like clockwork, uh, April 1st and November 1st, they switched. The last couple of years, they're a week off, you know. Uh, no big deal, nobody notices that, I guess. You know, maybe some people do. I started to see in the weather change, you know, 15 years ago, where I, it was like, this, this can't be drought, this, there's something else here. For the last 200 years, America has been progressing to a point that literally it's killing itself. And when people ask, well, what, what's happening? What, you know, what are we gonna do about it? It's, it's kind of tough because my response is always, we tried 500 years ago to tell you don't do this. We told you 300 years ago. We told you 200 years ago. And when we told you 200 years ago, you put us in jail. And so you're not listening to the change. To survive this warming world with its droughts and fires and floods, we need to change. And we can start by listening to the Gila. To me, to us, the river's basically telling us, join me. Don't try to stop me. Don't try to change me. Join me and live with how I change. There are reasons for those floods. There are reasons for times when rivers run slow. There's reasons for all of that. And so those changes need to happen. Thanks to Laura, our production team, and production manager, Anthony Lostetter, for all of their work on that beautiful piece. And as always, thank you for watching. We'll see you next week.
Funding for New Mexico and Focus provided by the viewers like you.